Our next speaker is Ben Spackman. We were just Yes, we were, just, we were just comparing notes. Ben Spackman ended up uh, becoming a fair volunteer when he wrote a critical email into us, uh, and uh, I, I suggested he join, and so he did. So that was good. Uh, ben Spackman is a PhD candidate in American religious history at Claremont. His dissertation examines the intellectual roots of LDS creationism and evolution in the 20th century. Uh, he, prior to that, he received a master's degree and did PhD work in Old Testament languages and literature at the U University of Chicago. He's a guest editor of a special edition of BYU Studies, and there's more you can read if you'd like. But with that short introduction, here's Ben Speckman. Thank you. All right, we're doing kind of a hybrid system here that I hope works for me. Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm glad to follow Jeff Thane's presentation yesterday on worldviews and assumptions and how we unconsciously adopt them, as well as Keith Erickson's uh, discussion of reading history and scripture in context. They dovetail nicely. Um, I'm a historian. I study change in the past. I try to understand what changed and why, and I try to help explain those changes. I want to start today with a couple examples of some startling changes in the last 150 years or so. Then I'm going to spend the rest of my time explaining them as best as I can in 45 minutes. We are skimming across a lot here, and just about every slide I have a, a post or a paper that I can refer you to that goes in more depth. So uh, to begin, in April 1932 General Conference, Heber J. Grant said, I rejoice that we are fundamentalists. We don't talk like that in general conference anymore. <laughs> what did he mean? Startling change number two. In 1935, there was a poll taken of BYU students regarding evolution. About equal numbers rejected and accepted evolution way back in 1935, and there was also a good bit of the undecided crowd. Now, a lot happens at BYU between 35 and 1973. Evolution gains a lot of scientific evidence. BYU hires a lot more science teachers. It starts dedicated evolution courses. So you might expect the acceptance rate among BYU students to go up. It did not, said the voiceover. Uh, rejection of evolution almost doubles, acceptance drops by a factor of nine, and there are far fewer undecideds. This shifts heavily to the reject stage, and people are not really wishy-washy about it. Number three, in 1935, 75% of BYU students reject a short creation period. That is, they accept that the earth is old, that it took a long time to create. Only 5% affirm a short creation period, 20% undecided. Um, by 1973, like evolution, that goes in a surprising direction. Far more BYU students are in the young earth or undecided category. How does that happen? Number four, uh, this is Charles Hodge, a prominent guy at Princeton Theological Seminary. He helped pioneer ideas uh, around fundamentalism and inerrancy. He said very bluntly, evolution is atheism, um, not mincing words. And yet, as we go through the 20th century, what we find is a number of prominent Christians across the spectrum who accept or are open to it. Uh, several popes, C.S. Lewis, Billy Graham. Evangelical scientists like uh, Collins, who ran the Human Genome Project and is the current director of the National Institute of Health. We also find evangelical Bible scholars who accept and proclaim inerrancy, who also accept and proclaim biological evolution of humans. How do we get from evolution is atheism to uh, inerrantist evangelical Bible scholars proclaiming evolution? Um, to be clear, these people are not atheists. Number five, William Bell Riley, uh, the grand old man of fundamentalism, founder of the World Christian Fundamentals Association and editor of the Christian Fundamentalist. Here we have the F word again. Um, he says in the 1920s, 
There is not a single intelligent fundamentalist who claims that the earth was made 6,000 years ago and the Bible never taught any such thing. Now you might argue that the adjective intelligent is doing a lot of excluding work here, but other studies have shown that young earth creationism was extremely rare 100, 120 years ago, early 20th century. Riley the fundamentalist is asserting an old earth position here. Now compare that to a 2013 study that said roughly 10% of Americans assert a young earth creationist position. That's on the order of tens of millions of people in 2013 believe that the earth is young in America. Uh, there are several stories of change here. Fundamentalism, understandings of Genesis, acceptance of evolution, the spread of young earth creationism, LDS views, and science. What is the unifying thread in these stories? What are the main ideas? Well, whether in science or religion, the position one takes on an issue depends on one's interpretation of the available data. And the interpretation you give is based heavily on the assumptions and presuppositions you bring to that. Second, uh, there are changing and competing understandings of science as well as scripture. And I don't mean scientific data, I mean the nature of science itself. And third, the primary mover in this story is not science, but assumptions about the nature of revelation, scripture, and interpretation. I want to elaborate on that slightly because it's not the narrative we hear in um, non-technical press, in mainstream press. What drives religious opposition to evolution and what reduces opposition to evolution is not science or scientific argument even though the public arguments often take that form. You know, Ken Ham and uh, Bill Nye arguing about cell structure and things like that. That doesn't change anyone's mind. That doesn't convert anyone. Rather, creationists are motivated by a desire to be faithful to scripture. That's it, that's the bottom line. Um, now that raises some key questions that we rarely discuss at all in the church. Namely, what is the nature of scripture? And how should we interpret it? Is scripture a superhuman encyclopedia of divinely revealed facts of history, science, and doctrine? Is it an entirely human book, which I don't think is an option for any of us? Is it some combination of human and divine? And if so, how? I've argued pretty strongly at FAIR for position number three. But how should we interpret scripture once we've talked about the nature of it? Do we just read it at face value? Do we need context? If so, how much and what kind? These questions about the nature of scripture and interpretation, scholars call hermeneutics, another word we don't hear very often in the church. Um, so with that out of the way, those, those five uh, changing things, Let's start with a brief definition and history of evolution. By biological evolution, I mean common descent. That is that modern species like humans and apes share and have diverged from a common ancestor. I contrast that with special creation. That is the magic wand instantaneous creation of animals, including Adam and Eve in their modern forms. Now, evolutionary ideas, sometimes called transmutation of species, they long predate Darwin. Darwin did not invent evolution. You have some Catholic theologians way back in the 13th century, kinda. Uh, you have Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who was a big uh, competitor to Darwin in terms of ideas about evolution, even though he dies before uh, Darwin puts out his stuff. Uh, Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, wrote and spoke about evolution. He wrote poetry about it. Uh, and then we have um, a book by Robert Chambers that he wrote anonymously, published in England in 1844, called Vestiges of a Natural Creation that was strongly evolutionary and generated all kinds of discussion, mostly in England because America was busy. Now what Darwin contributed himself in his 1859 book was a mechanism for explaining how species might change. And this was called natural selection, which I'm not going to spend much time on. Now, uh, after Darwin proposed his idea in 1859, again, America was kind of busy. There are other things going on in England, and we get a period that has been called the eclipse of Darwinism. This runs through the 1920s. During this period, Darwin had essentially convinced many scientists that evolution had happened, including human evolution. However, 
there were some good scientific reasons for thinking that Darwin was quite wrong about natural selection. And so this eclipse of Darwinism is essentially a period characterized by evolution, yes, but Darwin, no. Uh, and so if you're not reading the literature carefully at this time period, if you assume that Darwinism is the same as evolution, it's easy for you to take away the idea that scientists are rejecting evolution now. And this runs through the, the 1920s, the early 1930s. What gets us out of the eclipse of Darwinism is what's called the modern synthesis. This draws on the rediscovery of uh, Polish monk Gregor Mendel's work with pea plants about inheritance. And then it's augmented heavily in the 1950s with uh, the discoveries around DNA as the mechanism for passing on traits and its shape. That's all I'm going to say on that side of things, but it is important. So more generally about science. Science as we understand it was invented in the 19th century. That may be news to some of you who think that science is kind of this fixed idea and standard that goes back into the 1600s or further. So what exactly do I mean? Uh, well, first of all, in terms of the terminology, uh, British scientist William Hewell coins the term scientist in 1834, and it takes several decades to catch on. He kind of coins it as a joke, almost. But they didn't know what to call these people who were becoming more and more uh, frequent. And what I mean by these people is that in the 19th century, science became professional. It was something you did as a job. You could, you could be employed as a scientist. It became specialized. You tended to do one thing kind of deeply instead of skimming across physics, chemistry, biology, zoology, geology, as had been the case. It became technical, it became quantifiable, and it became secular. The 19th century is when the people we think of as scientists, even though the vast majority are deeply believing Christians, start getting away from saying, well, God did it, as a kind of explanation. What they are looking for is the natural mechanism that God uses to do these things. They are trying to discover the laws God put in place. So they start separating out theology from science uh, and it retained an extreme Baconian character. Um, now, some of you may have just perked up because I said Bacon. I regret that I'm talking about Sir Francis Bacon. He was uh, the father of empiricism. The Baconian idea of science was we got to get away from all these uh, Aristotelian ideas about qualities, and we need to go out and we need to catalog stuff. We need to measure things. We need to gather all the facts. You can't know anything until you've gathered all the facts. Um, and Bacon, in the 19th century, Bacon's name inspired in Americans an almost reverential respect for the certainty of the knowledge achieved by careful and objective observation of the facts known to common sense. Now, one of the problems with Baconian ideas of science in the 19th century was it didn't like drawing conclusions from facts. It didn't like saying, well, here are all the facts, and they point in this direction. Um, we're going to do more with that in a minute. Now, in the 19th century, as science starts rising, starts getting a lot of authority, people start thinking of science as the main way of knowing things, uh, it comes into conflict with a much more traditional source of authority, namely religion. And these two guys, at the end of the 19th century, basically create or popularize this idea that science and religion are both kind of fixed concepts and that throughout all of human history, science and religion have been at war with each other. Um, frankly, both of their books were insanely popular and maybe part of that popularity comes from the fact they were both really bad scholarship. Uh, I'll come to that in a second. One effect of this warfare model and the ascension of science was that it started becoming really important to portray scripture and prophetic utterances as scientific in nature, or as scientifically reliable. Think of Johnny Witzow's book in 1908, Joseph Smith as scientist. Well, what does that do in terms of PR for Joseph Smith? If he's a scientist anticipating PR, that is scientific proof of his prophetic ability. That is, that is baptizing Joseph Smith's authority with the authority of science, in a way. Um, Draper and White and this warfare idea were terrible. 
but the populace ate it up and it became extremely popular. Uh, the historian take is um, less friendly. Look at that subtitle. The idea that wouldn't die. Historians are very unhappy with the cultural effect that these two books had because in popular media, in students, in many adults, the ideas and the assumptions that they propagated still remain very, very present in our thought processes. Um, how many of you, for example, read or were taught as a kid that medieval Catholics thought the earth was flat and the sailors who went with Columbus were afraid of sailing off the edge? How many of you? Hey, how many of you never heard that, think that's crazy? Uh, that is absolutely false, as the historians know, but it was one of the false things popularized by these two writers. And they attributed it to the Catholic Church. They both had very anti-Catholic axes to grind. Um, so there's this new warfare idea. There's science rising, there's science and religion kind of in conflict. And there is a perfect wave of a whole bunch of things that just line up. You've got the ascension of science as the supreme validator of truth. You've got the Darwinian version of evolution. You've got the warfare hypothesis, science versus religion. You have theological fallout from the Civil War. Uh, very briefly, the Civil War caused kind of a crisis of interpretation for Americans because both sides used the Bible to argue 180 degree opposite positions. And they weren't merely theological abstractions. They were matters of life and death. German biblical scholarship, higher criticism, historical Jesus scholarship. This had been around for a while, but it hadn't really made it into America yet. It shows up after the Civil War and starts having a huge effect. The rediscovery of the ancient Near East. Uh, remember that Joseph Smith got some papyri and some mummies. Well, the archaeologists, or looters rather, did not stop there. Uh, the 1800s and 1900s saw the discovery of hundreds of thousands of texts and sites from the ancient Near East in Sumerian and Assyrian and Babylonian and Egyptian and other languages you've never heard of. And these all have, uh, well, they don't all have. Many of these shed light on the Bible one way or another. At minimum, there's some kind of context brought, but some of them also have creation stories that sound very similar to Genesis. They have flood stories that sound very similar to Genesis. And lastly, there are kind of the, the social things happening. There's a lot of industrialization. People are moving away from farms and into the cities, and as such, they're getting a lot more public education where the government is saying, this is what you have to study in school. Well, all of these factors lead to what's called the fundamentalist modernist controversy. And here's where our F word really arises in the history. Modernists prioritized the social gospel and downplayed other aspects of Christianity. That is, they looked at all of those things in my previous slide and they said, you know what? Maybe the most important things that we do are how we live our lives charitably. Jesus as our example of discipleship. Let's, let's take care of the poor. Let's start schools for uh, people who can't afford other schools. And um, we won't worry so much about things like atonement or miracles or we can, that's not, that's not the central stuff. Well, fundamentalists responded quite energetically that things like the divinity of Jesus, resurrection, miracles, atonement, and biblical inerrancy those weren't really secondary aspects of the gospel. Those were, as the word went, fundamental. They were central. They were non-negotiables. Now, fundamentalism and modernism was cross-denominational. There was not a church called fundamentalist. This split Baptists and Presbyterians especially, but you could also find Catholics who called themselves fundamentalist. Uh, and this is the general context in which uh, President Grant said, we are fundamentalists. Now you can quibble on that inerrancy bit, but otherwise we line up very heavily with these things and are not willing to say, those are negotiable. You don't need those. Now this raises the question, what was not fundamental? The age of the earth? Because the vast majority of Christians, the vast, vast majority of Christians in the early 1900s and 1800s all thought the earth was old. They thought the Bible taught it. A worldwide flood. Many Christians did not think the Bible taught a worldwide flood. Most thought it was local. And 
Evolution is also not one of these things in the fundamentals. Now, the actual word fundamental comes from a series of books written from 1910 to 1914 and published by two wealthy Californians and sent out to pastors all over the country. And in this series of essays, you find three, I think, on evolution. And one's a little ambivalent about it. One kind of says, well, it depends. And one is kind of, no way, sir, we do not believe that. Um, and notably, the one that is most adamant is written by a layman that was an editorial in a newspaper. The rest of these essays are written by uh, well-known and highly trained scholars. Um, now this was the case at least initially. After World War I, fundamentalism shifts. It becomes more populist, more anti-intellectual. Fundamentalism started as an intellectual university movement, a pushback against the other scholars who were pushing these things. Along with this populism and anti-intellectualism, evolution starts becoming one of the primary and overriding concerns. It's kind of the evil behind all other evils. The changing nature of science led to competing claims of good science versus bad science and claims that evolution was not scientific. Well, why? Uh, historian George Marsden, fundamentalists resisted Darwin, but they were not opposed to science as such. Rather, they were judging the standards of the later scientific revolution by the standards of the first, the revolution of Bacon and Newton. In their view, science depended on fact and demonstration, and Darwinism, so far as they could see, was based on neither. So if you held to a Baconian view of science, the older view, you could make all these rhetorical arguments about how evolution was bad science. But if you were moving into the newer understanding of the nature of science and the relation between data and extrapolating from that data, you would say, this is good science, you're kind of stuck in the past. Well, um, this gets us to the 1925 Scopes trial over the legality of teaching evolution in public schools. Now, what a lot of people don't know is this actually started as a PR stunt in a small town in uh, Tennessee. And um, unfortunately for them, it snowballed. And you got two of the biggest lawyers in the country who came to volunteer their services. And uh, if I remember the anecdote correctly, there was more radio coverage and newspaper print than anything that had ever happened in the country before on this trial. Fundamentalism at the end of the Scopes trial appears defeated. Um, if you've ever seen Inherit the Wind, which is a 1950s thing about the Scopes trial, uh, it's really about the Red Scare, but they make it about the Scopes trial. It really misrepresents what happened. It, uh, it gives you the wrong idea. Fundamentalism appears defeated. One of the things that comes out of the Scopes trial is that science textbooks at the college and high school level remove evolution almost entirely. And it disappears until the 1960s after Sputnik when they say, oh, maybe we should be doing more science. The Russians are ahead of us. This is a problem. Evolution, I'm sorry, fundamentalism, in fact, is not defeated. It goes underground. It grows rapidly and it explodes back into the public eye in 1961. What happens in 1961? Well, we got to go back and talk about this guy. This is kind of the, uh, the villain of science education. So twirl your mustaches. Uh, George McCready Price is a Seventh-day Adventist. He is the father of modern scientific creationism. He was a high school graduate with very little college exposure, often sold books door to door, was very poor. Uh, he was convinced that scripture was a divine recording of natural science, of, of facts of earth history. That was the bottom line. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, he accepted the authority of Ellen White's vision of creation that confirmed aspects about it. So he knew from his religious beliefs how the earth was created and so on. And he realizes that he can kind of kill two birds with one stone. He resurrects something called flood geology. Now, in his view, scripture as a divinely revealed history of the earth should control scientific interpretations of geology, biology, and other things. The geographic features and fossils found all over the world, the mountains, the valleys, everything, those were actually caused, in his view, by the global flood of the Bible around 3,000, you know, before the Common Era. And therefore, the earth was young because all of this stuff that geologists use to show an old earth, 
That was all due to the flood, and we know that was recent. Therefore, there was not sufficient time for evolution to have taken place. He's both defended the, the young earth position of the Bible, which is the true interpretation, and slain evolution. And so the Bible is true after all. Um, he published this in dozens of publications. And when they're reviewed by geologists who kind of get them from people who are saying, hey, what do you think about this? The responses are uniformly negative. Um, it's very amateur. It's, uh, it's incoherent. Um, it is not scientific geology. It is theological geology, one critic says. Well, what's significant is that Price is one of two scientists cited by William Jennings Bryan in the Scopes trial. He gets some publicity that way. Fast forward to 1961. Henry Morris and John Whitcomb are a theologian and a hydrological engineer. They are both young earth creationists. They are aware of Price, and they decide to adapt Price's material into this book called The Genesis Flood. Now, they strip out as much of Price and Seventh-day Adventism as they can. You know, you don't want Ellen White's vision in there because scientists aren't going to buy into that. Non-Seventh-day Adventists aren't going to buy into that. And they float it to a couple very conservative Protestant publishers, and they all get rejected. And they end up with this kind of podunk publisher. And uh, to everyone's surprise, it sells like hotcakes. It sells thousands and thousands and thousands of copies and gets translated into other languages and sent all over the world. And these two go on to found the Creation Research Society, which is still around. Now, hermeneutics. Because the Bible is inspired throughout, all its assertions are historically and scientifically true. The account of origins in Genesis is a factual presentation of simple historical truths. Well, no need for Hebrew, no need for ancient Near Eastern context, no need for Hebrew, for, for context, sorry. You just read it as it is. And the, the facts are there, unless you're an intellectual trying to get away from the obvious truths of the Bible. These are the hermeneutic assumptions at play. American scriptural geology, what Price had resurrected from the 18th century and brought back into the 19th century and then picked up in 1961 and spread all over, it was less about geology than about scripture, and less about the content of scripture than about its interpretation. In the end, scriptural geology and its more modern version, flood geology, were and are really symbols of a different question. How is the Bible to be interpreted, and how is information from outside the Bible to be considered and incorporated, if at all, into the interpretation of scripture? In short, scriptural geology was not about geology. It was all about hermeneutics. So, we're going to get into some LDS stuff. Back to 1925. We've got the eclipse of Darwin happening. We've got the early beginnings of the modern synthesis with Darwin, Mendel, and DNA. We're kind of coming to the end of the fundamentalist modernist controversy where fundamentalism goes underground. We've got the Scopes trial with evolution and William Jennings Bryan. Um, now, it's not well known that Bryan actually believed in an old earth. And he was fine with the evolution of plants and animals, humans excluded. They don't tell you that in Inherit the Wind. Brian is just kind of the, the idiot fundamentalist par excellence. Let's jump into LDS history. Latter-day Saints had deep sympathies with fundamentalism. Uh, given a binary with seemingly Jesus and science and scripture on one side and atheistic evolution and destructive biblical scholarship on the other side, Latter-day Saints, including much of church leadership, did not find that to be a difficult alignment to make. There was a strong connection with William Jennings Bryan. Bryan had spoken in the tabernacle. He knew several apostles. Um, President Grant loved his books. He distributed them by the hundreds to missionaries. He marked them up in his library. The Deseret News enthusiastically printed William Jennings Bryan's sermons. In 1925, right after the Scopes trial, we also get a revision of the 1909 First Presidency Statement on the Origin of Man. It gets shortened considerably with a lot of what is perceived as anti-evolution language taken out and republished uh, with new First Presidency signatures as a Mormon view on evolution. And it's sent to non-LDS newspapers and also published in the Deseret News. It's 
um, considerably less anti-evolution than the 1909 version. Now on evolution itself, there is mixed takes among church leadership from thundering rejection to cautious acceptance. Um, let's start with the cautious acceptance. Adam S. Benyon was the superintendent of LDS church schools. I think he was roughly the equivalent of the church commissioner of education. And in 1925, he gives a talk called Evolution in the Christian Faith. And this is at a CES training meeting. This is all professional seminary and institute teachers employed by the church, and this is the talk he gives. He speaks of the blessedness of an open mind. He condemns the ridicule and sarcasm of the monkey idea, that is, people who are dismissing evolution because we didn't come from monkeys. It's obvious. That's stupid. Um, and he covers four areas. He says, what is evolution? What are the evidences for evolution? And here he had read some technical works, which is interesting because he was not trained in science. What is the relation between evolution and the Christian faith? And what ought our attitude to be toward evolution, and particularly where ought the church to stand? Now, I think if the church had some kind of secret official position that evolution was completely beyond the pale, the superintendent of LDS church schools would certainly not teach all the seminary and institute teachers the exact opposite. Uh, another talk in 1925 that he gave, and I have not been able to uh, figure out his audience for this, but he says, we talk about evolution a good bit. It is forced upon all thinking men and women these days. That's a fun typo. You can tell what's on my mind. Uh, President Ivins, that is in the first presidency from General Conference, says, in the face of evolution, to seek truth and find it. I beg of you, older men and women, be similarly charitable. Because you may have been given a prejudice in your youth, do not feel to ask this institution, in the light of all recent learning, to close its doors to honest investigation. Now, President Ivins had spoken in general conference, and the gist of his talk was, look, whatever evolution happened, God was involved. That's all I'm saying. That's it. He was open to it, as long as it didn't kick God out. Now, on the thunderous rejection side, oh, Benyon, by the way, gets called as an apostle in 53. He replaces John Witso after Witso dies. Joseph Fielding Smith is on the thunderous rejections, rejection side. Now, what were Smith's interpretive assumptions, and what did he feel was at stake? Smith thought there was a stark contrast between science and the word of God. That is, science involved human interpretation, and scripture did not. Um, cover this a little bit more. Uh, in actuality, human interpretation is involved both in looking at the, the rocks on the ground, the measurements we make, as well as the data, if I can call it that, in scripture. We all have to interpret both of those things. There is human interpretation involved in both. It is not uh, this one-sided thing where we distrust science because humans are involved, but we can trust scripture because it's purely divine. That was one of his keys. Now, what was at stake for Smith? It's important to understand this because I think otherwise we, we mischaracterize him. We might feel negatively towards him. Smith thought pretty much everything was at stake about the temple, it surely is a deception if there were other races preceding Adam. If this Genesis story is not true, then there can be little real purpose in these ordinances in the temple. They are futile, meaningless, and not worthy of the place we give them. He thought the revelations were at stake. If I am wrong, then the revelations are wrong. If evolution is true, the church is false. You cannot believe in this theory of the origin of man and at the same time accept the plan of salvation. You must choose the one and reject the other. Uh, and lastly, in 1937, we may just as well close up our shop and say to the world that Mormonism is a failure. So for Smith, everything rode on this. That is why he fought against it so hard. And that position that he took stemmed from his interpretations and his assumptions. Um, now, a little bit of biographical background. He, of course, was an apostle, a church president. He was church historian for decades. He was part of the first correlation committee back in the 1940s that was looking at things that got printed and saying, yes, this is okay, no, that's not, you need to change this. He was also highly influential over generations of church educators, uh, seminary institute teachers, writers, and other general authorities. 
Now, what many of you may not know is he was also strongly influenced by George McCready Price, the Seventh-day Adventist geologist. As early as 1926, Smith is reading Price's books and suggesting them to his fellow apostles. And we have letters back and forth between him and Witso, where Witso kind of criticizes them, and Smith says, well, no, I think he's good. I think he's good. He can be cocksure because he's relying on the scriptures instead of the guesses of the geologists. So Smith sees in Price someone with similar assumptions, a similar commitment to the Bible, um, and he is reading them and recommending them to people. Uh, note the little underlined phrase here, I am not competent to discuss the theories of geology as my knowledge of the subject is extremely limited. Five years later, in the controversy with B.H. Roberts' book, Smith writes a 56-page rebuttal to B.H. Roberts, and he dedicates nine pages to the fatal mistakes of the geologists, and he quotes Price. So post-1926, he feels he does understand geology, and his informant is George McCready Price. Um, he actually, uh, you may remember that James E. Talmadge was a geologist. His son was also a geologist. And Talmadge is active in this discussion. And Smith actually writes to Price several times trying to get ammunition against James E. Talmadge. So they exchange letters. Smith later joins Price's flood geology kind of research group. He gets their newsletter called The Creationist. Now I want to jump ahead to the 1950s because that's where some major things happen. Um, that again is where things about DNA were discovered that really cement evolution to a great extent. Um, there are some major things with Protestants and Latter-day Saints. Uh, let's start with Protestants. Among Protestants there is a landmark book gets published by a Baptist named Bernard Ram called A Christian View of Science and Scripture. Ram challenged the fundamentalist assumption that a high view of biblical inspiration implied that the Bible was a reliable source of scientific data. In other words, Genesis could be absolutely true, even inerrant, but those did not mean that it was recounting natural history or that it was scientific. And Ram generated a lot of responses, uh, which I won't go into. Ram is also the guy who coined the term, or maybe he popularized it, concordism, which if you've read any of my works, you know I talk about a lot. Concordism is the hermeneutical assumption that scripture is speaking in scientific terms, and therefore, to be true and inspired, it has to match what science says. That's concordism. Now, every single book and paper I have read from an LDS person from the 1800s to the present assumes concordism. When trying to talk about creation or evolution or reconcile science and scripture, this is a pervasive assumption in Latter-day Saint thought, and it's not a justified one. Um, Ram's book opened up the door to Protestant scholars for um, interpreting the Bible in its ancient Near Eastern context, and I've mentioned this briefly. Well, in 1954, we also get Man, His Origin, and Destiny. This pushes Latter-day Saints the other direction. Uh, Smith quotes Price and a bunch of others. Same assumptions. At the 1954 summer school, again, all seminary and institute teachers employed by the church. Harold B. Lee is the teacher. Uh, his topic is fundamental concepts and teachings of the church, and he assigns Man, His Origin, and Destiny as the textbook. Requires everyone to write a paper on it. He gives several talks related to topics in Genesis, like the flood and creation. Uh, he pushes Smith's sources. Um, he quotes one Byron C. Nelson as a scientist. Nelson was actually a Lutheran pastor who drew heavily on Price. He also quoted Price, Dr. George McCready Price, eminent in his field, whom the geologists recognize as one of their standing. Well, none of that was true even when Price was writing books back in the 1900s, 1910s, and 20s. I don't know where Elder Lee got his descriptions of these guys, but he was quite misinformed. But think about the effect this has on an entire generation of seminary and institute teachers. Here they have two senior apostles, uh, because Smith is lecturing as well, recommending fundamentalist sources and concordist interpretations of Genesis as acceptable orthodox sources 
which had scientific respectability and personal apostolic approval. And uh, I need to hurry up, I think. Um, Elder Smith also spoke twice at that. He was invited because they were reading his book. He said he was not interpreting scripture. He was merely relating the facts as the Lord revealed them. And if any of the teachers disagreed, you have no business in the church school system. And several of these teachers actually did seek private meetings with President Smith, or Elder Smith at the time, and President McKay, and decided to retire, effectively. Leonard Arrington, church historian. There emerged at BYU in the 1950s and has continued among some people there, particularly in the religion college, a sort of Mormon fundamentalism, like Protestant fundamentalism, which emphasizes biblical literalism, rejects higher criticism in biblical studies, and the law of evolution. Again, note the linking of fundamentalism with particular kinds of scriptural interpretation and attitudes to evolution. Now from this point, we get a string of books by uh, Elder Smith and people who reflect Elder Smith's assumptions. These are published by Deseret Book. These are perceived as authoritative, as orthodox. And it culminates in the 1980 Old Testament Institute Manual, which has a 2,000 word quotation from a Seventh-day Adventist pamphlet called Creation, the Evidence from Science. There are referrals in the text to fundamentalist and catastrophist literature, which are recommended. It pushes a young earth. It quotes Joseph Fielding Smith, and forces a choice between the gospel and evolution. This remains the current manual, translated into dozens of languages, and uh, if you are a new convert in Japan or Brazil or Russia, this is the most detailed, most official, most accessible thing you have on what does the church teach about Genesis and evolution. And this is what you find. Now, this went up before correlation, and they approved it with no pushback, with one exception. They inserted the old earth option from Henry Eyring into the discussion of the age of the earth. That was it. And this, by the way, made the writers furious because it was so obviously not doctrinal. I want to take a slightly different tack as I wrap. I'm going to quote Elder Stephen L. Richards. There never will be discovered a fact in science which is really truth, which will not comport with the revealed word of God if the revealed word of God is understood and properly interpreted. Hermeneutics. There are mistakes in interpretation, misunderstandings of words, wrong ideas conveyed, but when the truth of scripture can be correctly interpreted, there will be no clash between any revealed word of scripture and the facts of science. How do we interpret? Well, the revelations of the new dispensation as well as those of the Bible were in the beginning and are now interpreted by men. And men interpret in light of experience and understanding. And it's clear if you read between my ellipses, he's talking about church leadership. In the interpretation of scripture and doctrine, they are dependent on their knowledge and experience. Old conceptions and traditional interpretations must be influenced by newly discovered evidence, not that ultimate fact and law change, but our understanding varies with our education and experience. Um, this is called the simultaneous contrast illusion. That bar in the middle is the same color all the way across the screen, but it looks different depending on what you're comparing it to. If we compare Genesis to natural history or science because we think that's what it needs to be compared to, that's the kind of thing it is, you end up either a young earth creationist, that's problematic, or you kind of end up denying science in a different direction, reading it into Genesis, which is what we've done. That is, when it's talking about the firmament, it's somehow talking about clouds or, a, or an ice canopy. And when it says there is matter unorganized, that's talking about maybe the Oort cloud. And, and these things were not in the mind of the authors of Genesis. That was not the, the audience and the genre and the needs that they were speaking to. If, on the other hand, you, create, you compare it to other ancient Near Eastern creation and flood stories on the left side, Genesis looks very, very different. It makes a lot more sense and there is much less conflict. Um, this essentially establishes that comparing Genesis with science is apples and oranges. It's not legitimate to begin with. And finally, a short personal note. Um, when my wife and I were engaged at BYU, I was a Near Eastern Studies and pre-med major and she was a molecular biology with a chemistry emphasis.
And our biggest argument, and the only one we both remember, was about evolution. Because I had become anti-evolution on my mission. I had foolishly traded a Hugh Nibley volume for a book called Combating Organic Evolution with the Book of Mormon, which was garbage. Um, and our discussion helped me understand that uh, maybe I was wrong about what I thought about the science of evolution. Science could not replace the simplistic story I read out of evolution. It seemed obvious at face value that evolution was not compatible with what Genesis said. Science couldn't give me that. I didn't get that yet, but it did convince me I was wrong. Well, off I went to six years of school at the University of Chicago doing Hebrew and Aramaic and Assyrian and Babylonian. And I quickly realized that my assumptions were not just slightly off, but not even in the ballpark. Um, and that really helped open my mind to evolution because I realized I had been interpreting scripture very, very wrong. And once I was embedded deeply in reading scripture in context, it changed. It changed what I saw the options were, and my opposition disappeared. Uh, I affirm that scripture and Genesis in particular are true, but I reject the fundamentalist assumptions that scripture is the simple recording of divinely revealed or dictated facts, that context is unnecessary, and that scripture really requires no interpretation. I wish we read scripture more and paid closer attention to it. At the end of the day, I am deeply a believer, but not a fundamentalist. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think it's a really interesting conversation. I think most people don't come to, don't expect to come to a religious uh, conference and talk about evolution. I think you'd find that if you did that with Seventh Day Adventists or I, others. I suspect some people have come here for exactly that, actually. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Um, it says, uh, okay, these are some of the questions we received. You say that the motivation for fundamentalists to resist evolutionary theory is to be faithful to scripture, but don't you think there are other motivations as well, such as feeling the need to resist secular science or concern about the tendency of atheism to latch on to evolution as a way of accounting for the universe while excluding the notion of God? Yeah, that's certainly there in the history, but that's secondary. There is a difference between the science of evolution and the secondary and tertiary philosophical interpretations of evolution that get put out by atheists who want to use the science narrowly as a club to beat religion over the head. And that is definitely something that people respond to. But uh, in my reading, I, I've read many published stories of how conservative evangelicals have come to embrace evolution. And almost all of them mention something about, I encountered something like Bernard Ram's book that helped me see that I was interpreting scripture wrongly with these assumptions that I didn't even know I had. So those, those aspects are certainly there in the history, but they're not the primary motivator. Makes sense. And I have two questions on Adam and Eve. Uh, you, well, this and will be quick. It, it's just, it's, what's your best idea of how Adam and Eve got here? Or uh, including, are you including the, in the special creation idea that Adam and Eve were born of heavenly parents through natural body processes? Or would you consider that idea to be a third distinct category from special creation evolution? Um, let's see. So. There are a variety of opinions expressed boldly by apostles in church history on Adam and Eve. Um, Joseph Fielding Smith is adamant that their spirits came from elsewhere, but their bodies came from here. Mm -hmm. uh, he does not expand on that much. Um, what, was, what was the first part? Uh, what's your best idea for how they got here? Uh, I am noncommittal. Um, I will say that if you read in this literature, there are a number of options presented by uh, believing scholars from a variety of other religions. Um, one of them that's recent is actually transplantation. That is, there was, there was human evolution, and at some point, God brings Adam and Eve here and just works them into the mix. Uh, another very popular one that um, I find somewhat attractive, but none of these are without their problems. Uh, is the idea that uh, there was evolution, and at some point, humans evolve enough, or, or humanoids, I, I'm not a scientist, I don't know that terminology. There is evolution to the point where uh, God essentially picks a couple and says, 
I can make a covenant with you. You are Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, by the way, they're generic names. They mean human and life, right? They're, they're meant to be symbolic and encompassing. Um, now, that idea, David O. McKay actually hinted at strongly in general conference while he was president of the church. He seems to have maybe embraced that. I'm reading between the lines a little, but he became very pro-evolution during his tenure as church president. Um, so you've got special creation, you've got evolution and transplantation, you've got evolution and then kind of a covenant couple. Uh, special creation, I said that already. So that, there are a couple other options. I, I'm not terribly concerned. I mean, my, my main motive in doing this, I am not an evolution apologist. I actually don't care about the science. I am mostly interested in helping people who find their testimony challenged by evolution and church history and what scripture says. My father, who was a biologist, he liked quoting, and I'm not even sure who he quoted, but he, his, his quote was, uh, Adam and Eve were the first people who spoke with God. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we have one person objecting to your, who were asking about your data about evolutionary beliefs among students at BYU. He said, uh, I, many of my fellow students took Dr. Jeffrey's very popular and influential zoology class that examined evolution in detail and accepted many of the truths of evolution. So. Jeffrey came to BYU in 1970. Dedicated evolution classes just started being taught in 71 or 72. They were verbally approved by President Smith, by the way, which is counterintuitive. Um, post, so those statistics come from 1973. Uh, and they come from, um, well, it'll be, it'll be in the publication version. But evolution at BYU post 1970s, 1980s is quite different than pre, I would say. And I have okay. other data on that. Okay. Um, a Jeffrey lot. is great. I've been in his archive a lot and interviewed him. So. Have you ever heard a story where Roberts or Talmadge found fossils and rocks from in and around Adam on Diamond and laid them on, the pre on President Smith's desk? Uh, I think that's getting some of the details wrong. That's actually from James E. Talmadge Journal, um, where he went to the supposed altar at Adam on Diamond in Missouri, examined it, found fossils in those rocks and said, well, here's proof that there was death before the fall, because otherwise there wouldn't be fossils in there. I don't know how serious he was about that, but it was kind of a conundrum for Joseph Fielding Smith, I imagine. Okay, uh, I, I'm not going to read this because we got one that's actually one to tease you a little bit from someone who knows you, so we're going to skip that one. <laughs> so... Um, um, so um, and I think we answered some of these others already. Um, so how do we defend evolution to LDS convinced fundamentalists? You know, there's been a lot of literature in the last four years about how do you argue with people who are holding untenable positions. Um, and the literature is all over the place. Some of it says you can't, don't bother. Uh, some of it says don't argue directly, just ask them questions and help draw out their assumptions until they realize. Uh, some of it jokingly said, well, if someone comes to you and says, I think the moon landing was a hoax, one-up them and say, you believe in the moon? Come on, what's wrong with you? Um, I don't think that was entirely serious, but, but sometimes if you can help someone perhaps realize that their position is very much an outlier, if they think it's mainstream, I mean, one of the things that I tried to highlight here was many people have the idea that there was kind of this literal interpretation of Genesis that everyone held to a young earth until Darwin came along. And, and it's really surprising to learn that virtually all Christians in America, I, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but the default view was an old earth from the 1800s, at least, onwards. Darwin didn't have anything to do with that. That's, that's very counterintuitive. So if you, can, if you can show people, you know, that idea, it came from a specific place and time, and it was very strange, and this other thing's been around for a long time. You know, those, those Catholic priests in the 13th century who were saying, when God creates in Genesis 1 verse 1, all he creates is matter with potential built into it. And everything after that is the naturalistic unfolding of that potential that God imbued it with. That is fascinating. Nobody knows about it. Uh, and here you have kind of quasi-evolutionists who are, you know, pre-scientific revolution, not responding to Darwin, not, you know, nothing like that. They're, it's fascinating to me. It's excellent. So 
I want to thank you for your time, both your time speaking to us here and your time you've, you've donated to FAIR. I know you've helped us much. Thank you so much. Thank you.